Good evening and welcome to the Audrain Automobile Museum here in Newport, Rhode Island. I'm Donald Osborne, the CEO, and I'd like to welcome you to this virtual seminar on our exhibition, Women Take the Wheel, Fashion, Modernity, and the Automobile, 1900 to 1945. This exhibition just opened a few weeks ago at the museum and has been tremendously received. It's our first collaboration with the Newport Historical Society, and we couldn't be more pleased with the way it's going with this exhibition and the companion exhibition at the uh, Historical Society, which can be seen at the same time. This exhibition runs through August 22nd. And for tonight's seminar, I'm joined by two terrific people, both of whom I, I know pretty well and who have a great eye for fashion and a great mind and passion for history. And Danita Sewell is joining us from Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, she is a fashion curator, author, and writer with dozens of exhibitions and books to her credit. Uh, she was the collections manager for the famed Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, Costume Institute, and also the uh, chief curator for the Phoenix Art Museum's uh, Phoenix Art Museum work, and continues to share her knowledge, passion, and taste with the students of Arizona State University's Herberger Institute for Design and Arts as the founding professor of practice in the undergraduate fashion program. She helped curate the 2010 exhibition of Fashion and Cars at the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles, and I'm delighted to see Danita again. Good evening. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me. And we're also joined by Rebecca Kelly, who's the guest curator with the um, Newport Historical Society and the co-curator here of our exhibition in the museum, uh, Women Take the Wheel, uh, Fashion, Modernity, and the Automobile. And she is a visiting scholar at the Newport Historical Society and the fashion curator and principal textile conservator for this exhibition and for the matching exhibition at the Historical Society. She's a textile historian and a part-time faculty member of the University of Rhode Island and the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD. She's the author of Fashion in the Gilded Age, a profile of Newport's King family, and which is edited by Linda Welters and Patricia Cunningham. And she works as a consultant uh, in assisting numerous organizations with the interpretation and conservation of textile exhibitions. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks very much, Donald. Looking forward to our discussion this evening. Indeed. Um, many of you may have seen the uh, virtual preview that Rebecca and I, along with David Demuzio, the executive director of the Audrain, did uh, a few weeks ago when the exhibition opened. And now we're going to take that to a level of detail uh, that I think we'll find uh, interesting and exciting. Of course, our premise here in telling the story of the exhibition is how the coming of the automobile changed women's fashions and men's fashions for that matter, but especially women's fashions and really worked very much to liberate women from the constrictions of late 19th century fashion. And uh, I know that uh, Rebecca, with the work that you've done in the exhibition uh, that's at the Historical Society, which is the 19th century part of it, because the clothes in the joint exhibition run from 1880s through 1945. So tell us a little bit about what the clothes of the 1880s were like for the typical upper middle class and, and wealthy woman. Right, Donald. Um, it was really great, actually. Some of the docents from O'Drain met me at the Newport Historical Society this morning, so we were just talking about some of these things, and it was a really wonderful opportunity for them to see the 1880s and, you know, um, 90s gowns with their long trains and these incredibly decadent and heavy silk fabrics that were either brocaded or embroidered with gold. Um, so all of these types of things, bustles and hoops, you just wouldn't have been able to safely climb up into an automobile mobile uh, dressed in some of those afternoon fashions. So it was it was great to chat with them about that. Yes, and it's, it's another thing that uh, we will talk further about how the uh, automobile uh, affected fashion. But one of the things that uh, especially we'll explore uh, tonight with Danita uh, is the way that fashion then in turn influenced the automobile. And uh, Danita, I know that that your particular uh, I won't say your area of expertise because you're expert in many, many, many things, but I think an area of enthusiasm and passion for you are the clothes of the 1920s and 30s. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do those say uh, broadly about the way women's fashion influenced the design of the automobile and vice versa? 
Well, you know, it's very interesting. Um, so when I was curator of fashion at Phoenix Art, uh, we did an exhibition there called Curves of Steel. And the more I started doing, and the premise of that exhibition was streamlined automobiles. And so the more I started doing the research on the cars, the more connections I saw with fashion. And the importance of streamlining um, form follows function, all of that, and how it began to influence the rest of the decorative arts and the way that they looked. And so you, you pair that with other ideas that were going um, through uh, philosophies at the time, eugenics, all of these different things about uh, health and exercise and the human figure. Um, you start to see streamlining truly affecting fashion. And you see the progression from these funny outfits that people were wearing, uh, dusters and things that were clearly identified with automobiling to um, a switch, I think, to where the clothes and the cars shared a common aesthetic, popular aesthetic. And so through that, we had um, uh, a really good time seeing those parallels in form. So. Um, yes, indeed. And, and we'll take a closer look at that story in a little bit. Um, Rebecca, one of the things that uh, was certainly a challenge, I know that Danita faced the same interesting challenge as well in putting together the exhibition which she uh, helped to curate at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles uh, on modernity. Um, the pairing of the clothes and the cars here at the Audrain was something that we spent a lot of time talking about. And we made a decision fairly early on that we weren't going to exactly match cars with clothes, but rather show the cars of a certain period and the clothes of a certain period and let the, the visitor see how they were interconnected. Um, why do you think we chose that path rather than sort of a match and uh, a match and identify? Um, I think because it gave us an opportunity to explore a lot of, you know, more complex themes as well. Um, you know, and I just really love the way all of the different sections of the exhibition have come together. Um, you know, the early cars from the turn of the 20th century, I think just look so fantastic um, with all of the dusters and the lingerie dresses, the types of things that women um, would have been wearing in Newport. You know, and I think for me, as much as I am a fashion historian, I've come to fashion in history through women's history more broadly. Um, so I think in that section, we were able to communicate this great spirit of adventure, you know, and that so many women wanted to participate in this new modern, you know, sport, essentially, you know, it was a leisure pursuit, and they were just ready to hike up their skirts and throw on the duster and get in the car. So I really love that aspect of it. One of the reasons why I'm standing where I am in the exhibition right now, uh, is twofold. One, because we have these two great uh, traveling outfits uh, over my shoulder on this side, but on the other side is this wonderful 1904 uh, Mercedes, um, which is very likely the very car which Gladys Vanderbilt drove in 1905 on the occasion of her coming out. And to think about the fact that in 1905, a young woman like Gladys Vanderbilt would actually drive, and this is a very powerful 30 horsepower twin chain drive car. This is not a little electric runabout that she's driving. And as was quoted in the newspaper um, quote that's on the wall behind it, her mother was riding in the back seat. So totally endorsing her young daughter's embrace of automobiling and the fact that this is something which is not only acceptable, but I support this. Now, what, what do you think that sort of thing meant, Danita? Well, you know, there are uh, articles in Vogue magazine from as early as 1905, 1910, talking about automobiling clubs that women had. And so, Rebecca, I don't know if you came across the same article, probably, um, but it's interesting to me that they were very, not only having a good time, but they were influential. So they were influencing legislation, um, uh, driving laws, they became very, very involved. And it wasn't just 
you know, one or two eccentric uh, people. It was really starting to be part of the culture. And I think interestingly too, when looking through the automobile magazines from the period, you start to see a lot of attention from the automakers realizing this is a big sector of our market and we need to make sure that the cars are interesting, appealing, uh, aesthetically uh, aligned with uh, women um, because they had a lot of purchasing power or a lot of influence in the decision. And, and that is something which we certainly see again in the fashion. I made the comment uh, to Rebecca when uh, the show was coming together about some of the dusters and, and hats that we see, um, obviously descended from the same type of garment that a woman would have worn in a horse-drawn carriage, but with much lighter weight material and much finer. And knowing that automobiling then was still quite an adventure. I mean, there are very few paved roads outside of cities. And as soon as you left town and the last brick uh, street stopped, you were in the dust and mud. And so to modern eyes, these look like very fragile things, but with the wonder of the automobile, this wonderful clean new transportation device, nothing like riding behind a mucky horse. You know, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting thing as well. And uh, Rebecca, talk to us a little bit about the actual textiles and development of textiles from the 1880s, from those brocades and those heavy fabrics to the lighter weight fabrics that we see around 1905, 1910. Yeah, I think that I really love what happens with fashion at the turn of the 20th century. It's kind of a time period that I'm particularly interested in. And I think women really do start making modifications to afternoon dress to incorporate more lightweight fabrics. We were all just chatting about the weather, of course, before we even um, uh, started the um, program this evening. And yeah, you just can't imagine, you know, I was working with two wonderful technicians as we were dressing this show. You think about wearing some of these heavy Heavy, heavy fabrics, um, you know, um, in a climate that's particularly hot. And, you know, for me, I think that resort living was all about um, adapting to this sort of more relaxed lifestyle. Um, and I think that resort places like Newport, um, in particular, really helped to push a lot of these fashion changes um, forward and kind of contributed significantly to a distinct sense of American fashion um, that was separate from other things. So um, I and have really enjoyed exploring that aspect with this exhibition. And it's also interesting, I think, uh, Danita, to see the rise of sportswear. We don't really address sportswear in our show here. Uh, the, the, the dresses and, and, and the cars are generally on the more formal side, but it's also interesting that, you know, we see the rise in the creation of sportswear in the 1920s as well. Mm -hmm. And the way that some of that now comes back into the dressier fashions. Uh, what can you say about that? Well, you know, I love some of the advertisements, the early ones from that period. One in particular that I was very fond of was a Chrysler ad. And it showed, uh, you know, one of the long cars, like 1920, early 1920s, long car. And in the background, you see the country club. So, but the two women are in the front. The woman is driving and there's a gentleman in the back. <laughs> and so <laughs> they're all using the car to escape and, and, and you know, go beyond um, expanding their lives and, and making it possible for those in the country to come in to, see, to the opera, as well as, so for fancier things appropriately dressed when they arrive, as well as people leaving and, and going on these adventures. And a lot of the early uh, automobile magazines or lifestyle magazines, as when you start to see the car on the country road and the tweeds and you know, really just expanding people's ability to, um, to advance their leisure, you know, options. And that's something that uh, also brings up a, a very important point. One of the things, obviously, that the creation of the automobile and especially the popularization of it by Henry Ford and the Model T, moving, not only moving people from rural areas to the city, but also giving people a, a level of mobility that humans had not enjoyed to that point. So all of a sudden, A, you had leisure time, and B, you could travel far, much further and to other places to do other things that you couldn't do before. 
And um, the idea of showing women driving their car to a leisure activity, uh, I think is something that, that, is, that is groundbreaking and something directly related to the automobile. And one of the cars that we have here in the exhibition is an electric car. And one of the things that certainly the manufacturers did was that they aimed electric cars squarely at the, the women's market because the, you didn't have to have the strength required to crank the car to get it going. It was much cleaner. Mm -hmm. Here in the exhibition, we have um, a 1911 Roush & Lang electric roadster, mm -hmm. uh, which was actually purchased new by Briggs Cunningham, the great uh, sportsman's mother. And uh, with it, Rebecca has paired it with this absolutely beautiful cut velvet uh, evening gown with wonderful um, uh, string of pearls, something which you could never imagine wearing in a gasoline powered car riding on muddy streets. So all of a sudden it's a totally new world. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Rebecca, uh, talk to us also about the aspect of what it meant to have one of these cars. And also we, we look at not just women in this, but also fashion as it related to men. We have, we are fortunate enough to have a wonderful uh, full livery of one of the Vanderbilt uh, chauffeurs. And tell us what that, the fabrics used, the tailoring, what does that tell us about how this person used these clothes? Um, yeah, so I think, um, again, we wanted to tell um, our story from multiple perspectives. So it was really a great opportunity to um, showcase this wonderful, rather rare, extant 1925 um, chauffeur's uniform. Um, and it's just a really beautifully tailored um, uniform. The jodhapurs, I think, Donald, you and I have discussed before about how that would be so important, you know, that the chauffeur was one part driver of the car, but it was also the mechanic. And the person who was really tasked with um, taking care of this car and if you got a flat tire or any of these things that could have happened very unexpectedly with early, early automobiling you know he was on hand um, to do that um, so yeah but it's you know it's made by John Patterson and Company of New York where the Vanderbilts often ordered uniforms and livery um, and it's just spectacularly tailored uh, uniform coat jodhapurs and a lovely great coat um, that he could have worn, worn over that um, in the colder uh, seasons, so. Mm. You know, they're really an extension of, uh, of, go ahead, of, they're really an extension of the horse-drawn, the traditions from the horse-drawn carriage that any wealthy family would have, have had. The, so the standards of decorum just transferred over. And it's, it's a very important thing to think about, uh, both from the horse drawn carriage days, and if you look at the limousine town cars, which very frequently had open chauffeur compartments or compartments for the chauffeur that could be open. So while the, um, the owner occupants rode in the back in enclosed uh, comfort, often with uh, portable heaters, uh, the chauffeur was in effect outside. So uh, he better had to be wearing a uh, substantial uh, wool clothing with a nice cloak and, and, and nice layering to, to keep him warm enough for his job. Um, one of our viewers has a question, actually two questions, uh, the first of which is an interesting one, certainly. Um, and they ask, would you characterize the women who dressed and drove as from the upper class? Well, I can take that yep. one possibly. So, you could say yes, maybe initially, but very quickly the, you, the automobile was far more ubiquitous than that. So I grew up on a farm in Missouri and my grandmother was the person in the whole family appointed to fix the car. I mean, she was a teenage girl. It was nothing, no, she's like, how in the world was I supposed to know how to fix the car? But everyone else was busy and they were working and they already had other jobs. So she said every time the car broke, her, ta her dad told her to go out and fix it. So I don't know. I think it was far beyond, you know, some of the advertisements that we see or the images of, you know, Tamara Lempica, which we love and imagine ourselves as modern women. You know, it was a lot of women. 
Yeah, I, I agree with Danita. I think cars quickly became quite practical, um, you know, and then by the time of the First World War, even, you know, women were joining ambulance corps and um, all of those types of things. So I, I think that that's a really interesting, you know, it transitioned quite quickly from something just from a leisure class to something that had real practical and necessary applications. And uh, the, the next question actually is also quite interesting because it sort of leads us into a next section, which is um, clearly uh, fashion was influenced by the automobile and the needs that someone riding and driving an automobile had. What was the influence on the fashions for people who actually had no intention of driving an automobile? Were these automobiling fashions also passed into sort of general uh, wear and design? Anita? Well, yes. Um, I think that that changed also very quickly. You know, um, when we did the exhibition at Phoenix Art and I did the research and we, and I was looking and I, I was just looking in a history of fashion book, actually. It wasn't anything to do with automobiling or anything. I was just researching the period. And that's where the title of the complimentary show um, that was in the fashion gallery emerged from called Automotivated. So the book was written in the oh, 1935, 1937, and it talks about, you know, 20th century fashion. And it basically says that the automobile is the, the largest change, is causing the largest change, not only in the world, but also in fashion. And it says like the conclusion of the book is, and now we see that fashion is truly auto-motivated auto motivated. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think that, that from the design point of view, the, the automobile had this great impact on where people could go and how they got there and, and all of that. But the design um, and, you know, from streamlining to, and our art deco and streamlining, um, it really made a big impact on aesthetics as well. We're going to take a look uh, in, in just a minute um, at that exhibition and some of the ways that uh, different parts of society from architecture through, um, through, through uh, product design uh, influence fashion and, and vice versa. Um, but I want to take another step back. We, we talked a bit before about the role of the automobile in the liberation of women and their societal roles. You talked about your grandmother being the one that fixed the car. Uh, she may not have been chosen as the one to maintain the wagons 20 years earlier. Um, but one of the things that uh, clearly happened as clothes became more casual and people were allowed out in cars, certainly social mores changed as well because suddenly you could have these two passenger cars with a man and a woman going out for a ride in the countryside and, and they're not wearing what they wore 10 or 15 years before. Um, Rebecca, what do you think the clothes that we look at as they transition from the 1910s into the 1920s also tell us about women's attitudes about their bodies and society's attitudes about seeing a woman's body? Yeah, um, wow, what a great question. <laughs> um, you know, so many changes again, I think just come so quickly after the end of the First World War. You know, it was such a dramatic breaking point in just so many ways, you know, socially and culturally, the world was just um, absolutely changed. Um, but yeah, I think also nightlife kind of changed. You know, the idea of breaking away from these kind of private house parties to living in a much more public Year, if we think about cafe culture and the birth of restaurants and kind of going out to see be seen um, was really um, quite interesting. And then, you know, I think all of the fantastic and sensational evening wear sort of propelled forward, forward by young women in the 1920s just you know, sort of seen incredibly shocking and radical um, to the older generation at the time, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to see some examples of, of, of that shocking transition. Um, if we can uh, see some of those slides from the, uh, that uh, Danita has, has given us, we'll take a look and um, we'll see some really interesting uh, images here. Um, and this is probably one of my favorite images. This is the image that's on the cover of, of the catalog of the book. And you can see how the shapes 
that are used in the tailoring uh, match the aerodynamic and streamlining shapes of, of the cars of the period. You know, Michael Furman was taking those great photos and they were coming through. We were organizing the court curves of steel book. And I was like, wait, but wait, that's like, that's our dress on the mannequin. <laughs> So you start to see the same uh, shapes and this sort of long, slender, gently curvaceous lines that were so beautiful in those cars and how, you know, the, the undergarments of the, of the uh, you know, of, of the period were creating that and bias cut for women's dress, so. And it's also quite interesting to see um, the sort of mixture. You still see some of the decorative elements that you saw in the dresses of the 1910s, and yet they're being sort of refined and, and simplified in a way uh, that also matches. This is a, a diagram on aerodynamics, basic aerodynamics, which of course were becoming uh, very important in cars as people sought to, to get more performance out of a given power plant. How could you do that? Well, if you have a big square and you're trying to push it through the air, it takes a lot more energy than uh, a streamlined shape. And uh, the fact that this is uh, not only an airflow Chrysler, but you see the ad for Roger and Gallet soap, and you know it's passing the wind tunnel test. You know, so it's uh, you know when your soap actually has to perform aerodynamically, then you know that you know society is changing. <laughs> One of my favorite cars on the planet, the uh, Dumonet Xenia. And this is great because you see aerodynamic streamlined forms in architecture. The building's not going anywhere, but it just looks clean and, and streamlined. So you want everything in your life with this mold. It became the symbol of modernity. And, and these- And with uh, that- you know, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I was just I was gonna, gonna say, Con the duster that we saw, you know, of, of 20 years before. <laughs> exactly. And of course, the fringe dresses. And ah, this is one of my favorites uh, from this. Now, who could have imagined 30 years before that you would not only A, see an ad for lingerie, but an ad for lingerie posed on a car. And this would seem perfectly uh, normal. And again, the form, the elemental forms. And, and this looks almost like a, um, uh, a Man Ray <laughs> photographed ad somehow. And this is also quite interesting as well, because as the cars become more dramatic in their design and de detailing, the clothes seem to be pulling back and this is a very interesting uh, shot, which we'll hold on for a bit, because this is an image from a Concorde d'Elegance. And today we think of Concorde d'Elegance as a fancy car show, but they actually originated back in France in the 1920s and 30s and then in Italy um, as a show of new custom coachwork and fancy clothes. And we talk here as well in the exhibition um, uh, in the museum here about couture fashion and couture automobiles. The cars that were bought as chassis from the manufacturers with a custom made body and then seeing these custom made clothes tailored to the customer for an occasion. And we have a number of those in the 1930s uh, section, 1940s section of the show, correct, Rebecca? We do. Um, yeah. And, and Danita's exhibition had so many beautiful 1930s clothes. I mean, it just is such a lovely elegant time period and I think um, you know those ideas came together really nicely and in, in the, the Audrain show um, there's a really wonderful uh, 1930s dress by Ardance, a little known couture house but one that I've been really interested um, in exploring further and it's just um, all the great hallmarks of some of the things that um, Danita was mentioning like these very simple um, bias cut dresses. You know, I think that the 1930s sort of moved away from the over surface decoration and surface embellishment of the 1920s and really focused on the technical aspects of dressmaking. Um, and that's why we just see all these gorgeous clothes that is really about the line, you know, in choosing fabrics, beautiful satins, extraordinarily rich velvets that, you know, read or communicate that so wonderful. And I think that's 
why they just look so great um, with all the cars and the chrome um, and everything. So it's fantastic. One of the other aspects that uh, we discussed is how people wore clothes back at the turn of the 20th century and in terms of display um, and what the relationship was between people putting themselves on display because they are showing themselves off as automobilists versus what happened from the mid 1930s onward into World War II and beyond. Uh, Danita, since your, your exhibitions have really sort of focused on that pre-war period to the immediate post-war period, what can you say about that as, as an aspect of style? Sure. Well, by then, so many cars were such a, you know, broad reaching part of daily life that that special, um, you know, purpose and, and transportation, uh, the car couture ensemble, as, as you say in the Concord Elegant, really wasn't the focus. It was just more, um, more about it, it eroded and, and it evolved into something else. Just like today, we don't have five, well, most of us don't have five cars. Some of us do out there, I know. <laughs> the car collectors do. Um, but most <laughs> people have a car that's theirs and they use it to go do what they need to do. And I think a lot of that started with the practical post-war era, you know, that, that people were just moving, moving forward uh, in their lives and, and, and progressing through what they needed to do. So I, I don't know if I hope I'm answering that well, so. You are because I'm going to actually bring us a little further afield. Um, this exhibition, the conversation was generally about the uh, transformation of women's fashion with the advent of the automobile and the adoption of the automobile. But let's just, bring it a little further forward into the 1950s, uh, if we can, and where do we see the same kind of influences from fashion into automobiles and vice versa after World War II that we saw in the decade leading up to World War II and the decade before that? You know, I bet Rebecca and I can find a piece of research for any era and argue <laughs> the cross influence. For example, one of my favorite, and I, I don't have it right here in the shelf behind me or I'd pull it out, but um, there was a series of, I believe it was a Lincoln Mark Fives um, that were different design. There was a Bill Blass one, there was a Pierre Cardin one, there was another. I would love to do that exhibition. And so uh -huh. then, there were and have all those cars together. I think that is the chicest thing in the world. And, you know, the Cadillac had a designer too, and I can't quite remember who did that one, but um, it was always, it's always been linked. And especially with the rise of the fashion designer, having more of a celebrity name that, you know, that link between the Cadillac and the, you know, the designer or the Lincoln and, and Pierre Cardin, you know, they, they put social um, ambiance, they put a certain um, cachet to the automobile itself and the, uh, thus onto the driver or the owner. Well, yeah. I, I think, <laughs> go ahead. I was just going to say, I really agree with Danita, and I think that a lot of automobile designers, you know, the apparel industry moves so fast, you know, it's like the canary in the coal mine. So all of us fashion lovers are trying to forecast and predict what's going to happen. And I think a lot of times, um, industries that maybe move just a tiny bit slower, have that opportunity to kind of pick up on trends. And, you know, I think it's going to be really interesting what happens uh, in the next couple of years with automotive design. Uh, we're seeing a lot of interesting things happen with fashion, and I, I'm curious to see how it's going to translate over. And as Danita was saying, I think there's always been that connection um, between the apparel industry and the automotive industry. Even if you look there's at it... another conversation. Sorry. Oops. We, we have another conversation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
even if if you look at today's design you see computational design playing a big role in both automobiles and in fashion look at 3D printed designs by Iris Van Herpen, and you look at concept cars that also incorporate, you know, they, they, they employ the, the eye of the computer. That, that, that is actually uh, very much along the lines of what I was about to say, which is another conversation. The three of us could have this great conversation, with, which we are having, um, because a number of years ago, there are questions being asked by car designers about why we were using in the late 20th century all of the materials which were associated with the late 19th century in cars. Why was there wood trim? Why were we using chrome? Why were we using leather? Uh, none of which were necessary because the cars are no longer open. And um, some manufacturers, I remember Maserati did this uh, for a while in, in one of their models. They had all this, they had performance fabrics uh, for the seat surfaces and they were using um, uh, sort of other other types of fabric woven fabrics instead of leather or carbon fiber or full carbon fiber in the cars and it didn't last very long <laughs> people thought well i don't really want to ride in my gym clothes um but it's still so, so it was interesting that people were thinking about what else can we do that's more reflective of our era and that takes me back because one of the favorite things uh in the exhibition here are a series of advertisements, which again shows how quickly things progressed in the automotive world. They were ads for Duesenberg, one of the most expensive and high performance cars of the age. And there were ads with no cars in them, just a drawing of a woman, usually from the back with her head slightly turned and it simply says, she drives a Duesenberg. And you just looked at her and you said, I know what this car stands for. And that whole idea that the self-expression in fashion became self-expression through your car. And I think that's the direct way that fashion really influenced the automobile starting in the 1930s. Mm. What do you think? Well, I, I was thinking about that today, Donald, and then, you know, we are on the East Coast. You and I now spend a lot of our time on the East Coast, but I was thinking a lot about Hollywood and, you know, mm -hmm. this notion of celebrity that also comes about in the 1930s because we were talking a little bit about cars in Newport and certain people being a little averse to the news hawks or the press attention. But what about out there in California where it was all about kind of making a spectacle, perhaps, um, you know, and I found some great images of Greta Garbo driving a Duesenberg and I was like oh wow you know um, so that was just something that, that sort of came to mind um, for me the notion of celebrity and the automobile and Hollywood and the automobile. And we have a bit of that in the show here um, as we were talking about the transition of being on display uh, in the early cars in the 1910s uh, and, and 19, early 1900s to by the time you get to the mid 1930s, seeing cars uh, with what they call blind C pillars. So you can't see who's sitting inside the car. We've got a couple of examples here in the show. Uh, 1938 Brewster Ford, uh, this 1930 Duesenberg town car that was built for uh, Nanoline Holt Inman Duke, Doris Duke's mother. And even more dramatically, a 1938 Packard Rolston Landolet built for Doris Duke herself, which she commissioned, she was 26 years old. And it's completely covered in the rear, but it's a landolet, so the rear compartment can be dropped and open. So if she chooses to be on display, she can be. And if she doesn't want to be, she's hidden from the public. What do you think about that, Tanita? That, that, that whole idea and that, that influence? Mm, well, you know, custom. Oh, it sounds lovely. You know, I mean, that is, that is custom. And, and, you know, on that level, you're talking about someone who's wearing couture and they're having the same conversations with their couturier about what their needs are and what they want and what's perfect on them. So it's lovely. I wish I, 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 wish I could come see that and really look at it. Um, and I think, you know, boy, um, going back to what fashion is right now, there's a big emphasis on individuality. There's a big emphasis on manufacturing on demand and customization, picking out your Nikes with certain laces and eyelet colors and all this. And so um, isn't it interesting to think about 
how some of those luxuries, which that really is a luxury, to have something custom made, may have more opportunities now in our high tech technology driven manufacturing world. I don't know. It's a really interesting idea. Well, I can tell you that custom, custom work is definitely coming back in the automotive industry. <clears throat> there are a number of custom coach builders that have begun doing uh, work in the last five years and manufacturers now, such as uh, Bentley and Rolls Royce and Porsche and Ferrari are now taking their customization programs to the next level so that they will work with you to create that expression uh, of your own personal style. Now, one of the things, of course, that also <laughs> comes into play is, does a where does a manufacturer draw the line with the expression of your personal style and their brand image? So, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to, to say to Chanel, I will give you a lot of money if you will uh, make something for me and for me alone, but something that may not actually to their image. So that could be an interesting thing to see as it, as it moves forward. Very much so. <laughs> and uh, we have another question from one of our viewers. Um, were there particular uh, clothing manufacturers or designers that created women's automotive apparel uh, or, or that specialized in it or really sort of were leaders in the field? Rebecca, have you seen any in your research? Hmm. I think, you know, I think so many things get maybe lumped more generally um, as outerwear and sportswear and there, you know, are particular makers of those types of things. Um, you know, all of the great like wax cotton jackets and things like that. So as all of that technology came about, I actually probably see more like in patent and textile design, um, but then it would end up being with various retailers, perhaps. Um, what do you think, Danita? Yeah, I mean, I think that there were people that were already doing similar types of things. You know, even Abercrombie was one of the early makers. Um, uh, Burberry, you know, that was already using fabrics, making utilitarian, military, they might have already, companies that might have already been doing camping gear, outdoor gear could easily transition into this sector. Um, I'm sure if I dug through my research um, enough, which I saved it all, um, I could find a more specific answer, but that's what comes to mind. And, you know, there were small ready to wear manufacturers making these things and, and making other types of uniforms too, usually, or sporting goods. That actually is a very interesting point because it brings over the crossover between practical, um, functional clothing and fashion. And I think that that's one of the things that we also see with the impact of the automobile um, on fashion, the fact that things that were practical things became style. Because, you know, today, well, actually, I can't say today people wear car coats because only I wear a car coat. But nonetheless, there's a coat that I have, which I bought, which is called a car coat because it is of a length so that you can sit in the car, as opposed to a duster, which is very long to protect yourself. This is just a man's coat that comes to the knee um, because you don't want a long overcoat when you're riding in the car, but you want some protection when you're outside of the car. So that's something that was totally a practical item, but yet it becomes a fashion piece at this point. Mm -hmm. what, um, what, what examples can you think of that are, uh, comparable in, in women's wear, that thinks that only started as something practical, but became a, a fashion item. Well, um, what about the jumpsuit? <laughs> Riveter, <laughs> and, you know, all the way to Yves Saint Laurent, Rive Gauche. Um, you know, the, uh, the trench coat, which was started as a men's military, then ends up as a, a fashion item. Uh, there are many, you know, we could, t-shirts, honestly, um, started out as practical and now are high fashion or can be high fashion. Um, 
Yeah, I think knits in general, even sweaters, you know, the time period that we're covering is such a great um, time for knitwear, you know, and Rodier and all of the great European knitwear manufacturers, but then the Americans like really jumped into that game like very quickly. Um, so I think there's some great examples of, you know, knitwear, which is essentially what we all love so much today, uh, you know, really came out um, with some of this early sportswear. So I think that's another one. Another uh, practical aspect of the influence of the automobile and fashion is, of course, footwear. We talked about the, uh, the jod purse that the, um, the Vanderbilt chauffeur wore, which accommodated the boots, which are absolutely necessary for going out in the muddy roads. But what about footwear for early automobiling and, again, in, uh, as it developed through the 1920s and, and, and 30s? Yeah, that's a great question, Donald, which I'm not really sure. I just think of all the really beautiful, gorgeous shoes of the 1920s and 30s. And now I'm thinking, wow, they're actually quite delicate and of really decorative fabrics. I wonder if they're good for driving. <laughs> what do you think, Danita? Well, you know, the, the rubber boots um, in the 20s were first coming out, and I don't see them as particularly connected with automobiling, but just a more practical. Um, and I'm sure women could adapt shoes that they use for equestrian sport. You know, so many of the women that I've done research on in Newport, you know, um, uh, really their love of sport came through equestrian sport. So I sort of think a lot of that footwear would be adaptable for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a, a very interesting uh, thing. I know that for myself personally, <clears throat> there are certain cars that I have to wear driving shoes in order to drive because of the pedal arrangements. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, need a little water here. Mm -hmm. I've been chatting for a bit. It is um, one of the things that <clears throat> you think of what do you wear to drive a car versus what you wear when you get out of the car. And there was a car that I owned that I could only drive using driving shoes. And I kept a pair of driving shoes in the car that I put on once I got into the car. And then I put my regular shoes on once I got out of the car. Um, not that I'm a slave to fashion, um, but, uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, you do what you have to do. And I heard a wonderful story recently about a, uh, a quite uh, well-maintained uh, luxury car that was uh, owned by uh, one woman from New. And one of the things that, that amazed the uh, person who bought it was the fact that um, the uh, leather uh, heel guard underneath the pedals was almost unmarked, which is almost unheard of, especially in a car that's only been owned and driven by a woman. But apparently she loved this car so much, she actually drove it barefoot. So she would get into the car, take her heel off to drive her car and then put her heels back on to get out. So again, the things we do for style. Wow. It's, it's absolutely astonishing. <laughs> That's a great idea. And I think that uh, <laughs> this, this, is, this has been a, a delightful conversation. Um, and I want to thank Rebecca and Danita for joining us tonight. And also for most importantly for me, uh, not only exploring this great topic of how fashion and the automobile influenced each other from the turn of the 20th century, but what we can look forward to and what we should look out for going forward. I think it's a conversation that we can continue and certainly something that we can explore further in ex exhibitions here at the Audrain Automobile Museum. We can look for uh, that in other museums around the country and hopefully around the world. And I'm also looking forward to further collaborations with Rebecca and Danita. We're going to bring you here to Newport as well. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for your participation tonight. And uh, thank you for joining us, all of you watching. And if you're watching this later on our YouTube channel, be sure to look at our other videos of our other virtual openings and our other uh, virtual seminars, which are available for viewing here on the Audrain Auto Network. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.